bring in Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk Live co-host. Mike, we are proposing Nover time during the regular season. What do you think? Old school, pre-1974. That's how it used to be, ties. Do you like ties? I don't like ties. I, and I guess it's on the two teams involved to make sure there isn't a tie. And with so much more scoring now and the two-point conversion, it's easier to avoid a tie than it would have been back in the early 70s and prior to that. I, and Dan, I, you're onto something in this respect. I believe that this push to go back to true sudden death over time with this spot and choose concept, which I actually am intrigued by. Okay, wait, believe- explain that though, Mike. Okay. So this is just proposed of right. a new a new overtime uh, possibility. A new overtime possibility proposed by the Ravens. There's two types. There's a sudden death and there's a straight seven and a half minutes. I'm told Bill Belichick prefers that. Seven and a half minutes of football, whatever the score is at the end, that's the final score, win, lose, or draw. Spot and choose means in lieu of a, of a coin flip to determine first possession, one team picks where the first drive begins. For example, our own 20 yard line, the the minus 20 as the football people call it, your own 20 yard line. One team picks the spot and the other team says whether they're gonna take the ball and play offense or give the other team the ball and play defense. It's as equitable as it can be. It's as fair as it can be. It reminds me of the old Sesame Street sketch where you you share a cookie by one person breaks it in half and the other one chooses which half they want. Totally fair. And I think it adds layers and levels of strategy that, that will probably drive coaches and analytics departments crazy. But it's so much better. If you're going to go back to true sudden death, it's so much better than the coin flip. Now, the two ways the Ravens are proposing it, sudden death with up to 10 minutes or this Belichick preferred seven and a half minutes play that full amount and whoever's ahead at the end wins, which, which creates, I think, a, an additional strategic angle if you've only got seven and a half minutes you want to make sure that you have enough time to do something with the ball when you get it back so it's just layers and levels of strategy Hmm. that that i think would drive coaches crazy but i think it would be fair to both teams could i have you start on the one yard line well you could pick the one yard line but then then the other team team gets to choose whether to be offense or defense that's the beauty of it okay okay and, and I'm told, Dan, that the analytics people are viewing the 13, the minus 13 as the break-even point, that if the, the team that picks the yard <laughs> position says 12 or less, then that's when you're likely to choose to play defense, 14 or more, you're likely to choose offense in the standard case. But think about it, your quarterback, how you feel about your defense, how, how you feel about whatever plays you have left in, in, in your game plan for the day, how you feel about your kicker, what the weather conditions are. So many things are going to go into that decision. Are they voting on this? I know it's just a proposal. Does it get put up for vote? Well, they're presenting it to the competition committee to try to get them on board with it. It has more heft, has more weight if the competition committee is behind it. But, but the most important person to have behind it is the commissioner. And my understanding is the commissioner likes it because, number one, it makes the game shorter. And this gets back to the point you're making with Novertime. I think they want the games to be shorter, Dan, not for this year, but I think it's some year down the road, four, five, six, whenever, they're going to start dropping games into more standalone windows. And this Tuesday night football that we saw a couple of times this year, Wednesday afternoon at three o'clock, they're going to get creative about having more standalone games because as gambling proliferates and as real-time in-game betting becomes technologically available where you can sit at home with your phone and what you see at the stadium is what's coming into your home at that moment so there's no latency, it, it makes more sense to have not nine games being played at once. As many games as possible that are the only game where everyone's watching, everyone's engaged, and everyone's betting one play at a time on those games. So you make the game shorter. Here's why you make the game shorter. Because you're going to have teams that are playing on a five-day break, four-day break, six-day break. You can't be playing for 70 minutes. So I think that's why they want to make the game shorter. So your idea from that perspective is brilliant. Thank you. Because every game is capped at 60 minutes. Could you propose that? I don't don't have the commissioner's ear. Could you? (laughs) You think I do? Oh, you don't either? (laughs) Uh, no, 
no, but 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 I, he, I'm sure he would not turn up his nose at a good idea. I just think that that the idea of going back to tie, I, we just have to we'd have to accept ties. And but the strategy know. of a tie in the fourth quarter, like imagine that now all of it, it, it changes your philosophy of what you're doing. Instead of how many times we, well, they're playing for overtime. Now you can't play for overtime. Nobody's taking a knee. Yeah. Now you actually are saying, are we comfortable with a tie against this team or do we want to go for a win? Or, or you know, go for one versus go for two. That, that, yes. when, when no overtime was the rule, Pre seventy four, you didn't have that option. That that see, that's the beauty of it. I think, and here's where I think they're onto something. The way the game is today, I think that there would be fewer ties, and that, and that you know, with, with all the analytics and the in the the strategy and going for two and all the different things you can do, I, I just think that you would see less just kind of shrugging. I think they just used to shrug at a tie. Yeah, it's a tie. Okay, we'll, we'll get them next week. I think it would be far different if that were the case now. All right, a couple of things. I know we're short on time. Uh, the roughing the passer reviewable, that's, that's being proposed, correct? Yes, and I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. The reason I don't like it is 2019 pass interference, replay review, calls and non-calls. The standard kept changing. You can watch the available angles and you can see a glancing blow. And if it's frame by frame, is that forcible contact with the head of the quarterback? I don't like it. And think about it, Dan, every interception, what's going to be part of the replay review? Hey, was there contact with the quarterback? Was it possibly roughing the passer? I, I, I like the concept, but I don't like the execution that it likely would entail because we saw it two years ago and what a disaster pass interference was. I continue to be a believer, and the Ravens are proposing this as well, the booth umpire, the, the extra member of the crew who sees what we see at home and can talk directly to the referee and say, drop a flag, pick up a flag, you guys are making a mistake. No different than another member of the crew who runs up and talks to the referee yeah. and they pick up a flag. That's what they need, and they've been reluctant to do it but I think that's the key because what you see when you're on the field and what you see at home are two very different things. They need a referee, an official who sees what we see at home and can talk to the people on the field. Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk Live co-host, of course, his website, profootballtalk.com. The fumbling the ball out of the end zone. <laughs> Clark Hunt, the owner of the Chiefs, the team that benefited from that rule in the division round of the playoffs, suggested before the Super Bowl that that rule would be looked at by the competition committee. There's no proposal yet okay. on that rule. And I, Dan, I just don't think they're going to change it. It's always been there. You know, once upon a time, the rule was if you threw an incomplete pass into the end zone and it hit the turf, it was a touchback and the defense got the ball at its own 20. There's just been this sacred treatment of the end zone. And that's where this comes from. As unfair as it is, here's the reality. It's fair in that it affects both teams equally. And, you know, it may screw you in one game and you may benefit from it in another game. The thing I don't like about it, though, it penalizes effort. And you see a guy making maximum effort to reach the ball out to the pylon. And if the ball slips out of his hands and just goes out of the end zone one inch in, you lose the ball. If it goes out short of the end zone by an inch, you keep the ball. If it hits that pylon, you lose the ball. That's what I don't like about it. How about we extend the end zone? Like CFL? Yeah. That, uh, that, 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 would, that, that would make uh, – well, you know what you'd have to do? You'd have to go back and rebuild half the stadium, <laughs> wouldn't you? Yeah. That, that would be the problem. I'm all in. I'm, I'm good with that too. Like, yeah, help the economy. <laughs> Get, create some jobs there. Uh, anything new – well, let me uh, – Roethlisberger re-signing. felt like he had to fall on his own sword to uh, take less to stay there. But uh, your, your thoughts when Roethlisberger announced he was coming back? General business advice for anyone out there who's ever negotiating a salary with his or her employer. Once you say, I don't care how much I get paid this year, yes. you can't take that back, Dan. <laughs> and once he said that, he's not getting 19 million this year. The question is, what's he getting? And that's why it took so long. If he's getting 19 million this year, it's a half hour negotiation to figure out how they're going to move the money around and reduce his cap number. Once he said that, he's getting squeezed. And I'm surprised he only got squeezed for $5 million. So it gives him some cap space. I, I, I just, I think they're delusional. 
in thinking that they've got a championship team. This isn't 2005 Jerome Bettis, let's come back for one more run and go win a Super Bowl. There are some great teams in the AFC. And yeah, they were 11-0 and last year. Eight of those games could have gone either way. I also wondered about Deshaun Watson, the timing of when, if you're going to trade him, when do you trade him? And I thought, you know, I, I just have a for sale sign or, you know, like a yard sale. I just say, come on in, give me your offers like Detroit did. But I'm wondering, is he more likely to get traded closer to the draft? Does that make more sense? Uh, but I don't even know if we're there yet. But uh, what do you think about if he is traded, what the timing would be for that? Dan, I think with all these teams that are looking for quarterbacks, evaluating their options, the problem is if you wait until the draft to trade Deshaun Watson, there are teams that will have made other plans at quarterback, and then they're not at the table. And that could be a team that helps drive another team up to a higher price. You know, John McClain of the Houston Chronicle echoed something that we had said a few weeks ago. They should get the Jets and the Dolphins in a bidding war. Do it now. And, and uh, hey, if you don't trade for him, you're going to have to deal with him twice per year and play them against each other. You know, Russell Wilson's agent very artfully got it out there, the four teams that he'd be willing to accept a trade to. At some point, the Texans need to find out where are the places Deshaun Watson would play. Let's get those teams at the table. and let. But, but first, they have to come to the conclusion that they're even going to do it. I feel like at this point, they are in the the, I don't know, anger, denial, bargaining, depression, acceptance, they're probably still in the denial phase. <laughs> and, and they just refuse. They refuse to accept the fact that this guy is never going to play for them again. And Dan, have you seen or heard anything that contradicts the prevailing notion that he's never putting that blue helmet on his head again? No, no. And I, that's why I didn't understand why they, they just didn't say, come on in, compete against each other, and hopefully we'll get an even bigger treasure trove here. The Russell Wilson, there, it doesn't feel like there's any real news on the Russell Wilson front. We're trying to make news. Um, you know, uh, I, I guess his agent said or somebody said, uh, this is the reason why he likes the Bears. That doesn't mean he's getting traded because he likes Matt Nagy in the offensive line here. But um, I haven't heard anything more internally about this situation. So did Russ accomplish what he wanted to accomplish when he came on our show? Well, well and, and let's think about the timeline. The stuff he said on your show was jarring. And I've never heard a quarterback talk that candidly about his situation. I think Tom Brady's to blame or credit for all of that because these guys see what happened with Brady. They want to flex their muscles. That was great. But then it got quiet for a couple of weeks. So you kind of start thinking, well, maybe they've worked things out. Well, then comes the athletic article that that pulls some scabs off of the situation. Mark Rogers says what he says on the record, which was as jarring as the comments <laughs> Russell Wilson made. And now it's quiet again. Just because it's quiet doesn't mean nothing's happening. I mean, Seahawks uh, have to be considering their options. And the four teams that are identified by Rogers, Raiders, Bears, Saints, Cowboys. How do you not, at a minimum, get all the, the decision makers together and say, what, what would we be willing to do here? And I've said this about the Saints, Dan. When you look at the cap mess that they're in and the guys that they're going to have to part ways with, how do you not call the Seahawks and say, just tell us who you want? Because there's a chance they want some guys that you're going to cut anyway. Or maybe they want a guy that you're on the fence about so you can trade him and keep one of the guys that you're thinking about cutting. So I just think that that – Russell Wilson is good enough that those four teams need to at least at least explore it, even if it means calling up the Seahawks and saying, tell us what you want and we'll see if we can come close to it. Because Russ can't have his feelings hurt if you reach out to the Saints, whereas Deshaun Watson, you know, maybe that's different or some of these other teams where they reach out and you go, oh, gosh, don't let him find out that you reached out. Russ's people probably go, OK, like you have to do your due diligence. If I'm exactly. Seattle, I just find out. Like, I, I just want to know if it, if it gets worse, then at least I know, hey, you know what? The Saints will give us this. Hey, you know what? The Bears will give us is this. Put those two, pit those two against each other and let's see what we have here. Here's what it comes down to. And this was my takeaway after reading the item in The Athletic. Russell Wilson views himself as Patrick Mahomes, and he has every right to view that. We haven't seen him in a situation where he is a Patrick Mahomes, where the offense runs through him and it's orchestrated to get the most out of his abilities. That's what he wants. If the Seahawks don't view Russell Wilson 
the way Russell Wilson views Russell Wilson, then trade him to a team that does. Because necessarily, whatever that team offers will reflect what they think of Russell Wilson and the Seahawks will look at it and say, well, these, these bastards are crazy. <laughs> why, why are they offering this for this guy? Let's take it, we'll take it and run. Have a great weekend, Mike. Always great to talk to you, buddy. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. See you, pal. Mike Florio, Pro Football Talk.